Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Otero County in New Mexico, two sisters were on their way to their mother's place to pick up children for a birthday party. As they turned onto the dirt gravel road to the house, they saw something sitting by the left side of the road. When the car light illuminated it, it stood up to a height estimated to be seven foot or more. One of the sisters refused to look at it after one glance. It was hairy all over with a kind of pointed head, long arms, and no neck. It moved off toward the river. The sister turned into their mother's driveway and did not see it again. They were very frightened and were sure it was not a bear or a human. My husband and I were visiting our adopted family in August. Having arrived there on the 21st, we were in our prop-up camper parked by the river and behind the brush arbor across the driveway from Grandma's house. Next door to her house lives her son and his family. Her son was away on a fire, along with his son, but his wife and daughter were at home. On the 21st, we had set up camp, ate, visited, and went to bed early, around 11 p.m. Everyone was asleep except me, and I was drifting into sleep when I felt a very strong jolt to our camper, which made everything rattle. I thought it might be a horse or cow, but the impact was higher than a horse or a cow, like at the roof line. I was too scared to move, but didn't know why. Nothing more happened, so I went to sleep and told my husband about it the next morning. He sleeps like a log. On Saturday, August the 23rd, the whole group of us, maybe 20 people, had cooked and eaten outside, and after cleanup, we all sat around the fire in the brush arbor, enjoying the cool evening and visiting with old friends. I was talking, and way off somewhere, kind of remembered hearing a sound like a baby crying. The little girl sitting next to me said, Do you hear that? I responded that I didn't hear anything, and she said that weird howl. Immediately, the adult stood up and told the children to go to the house that it was time for bed. They all heard it, whatever it was. My husband and I and our two little granddaughters sat there for a short while, wondering what was going on, and then went to our trailer and went to sleep. The dogs barked and howled almost all night. The next morning... Sunday, I woke up and went to the house for coffee. All of the family members were already there, talking. I listened for a while, and the topic of conversation intrigued me, so I asked what everyone is talking about. Dead silence. I jokingly said that it sounded like to me they were talking about Bigfoot. One, then another of them began to talk about it, and I said, why didn't you tell me? Their response was, that they didn't want to scare us off. I told them I'd been interested in this for years. Then the stories came out, such as the first one cited herein. Two of the grandchildren the previous night had been on their way to their grandmother's house as they turned off from the main highway to the old highway where there was a sharp left-hand curve in the road about 50 yards in and where the remains of the old highway continues to a dead end to the right. They saw the being. It was right at the curve where they saw, crossing in front of their vehicle, a very large, hairy, long-armed figure, which they observed cross the dead-end portion of the road and crash up the hill through the brush. They continued on to Grandma's house. As we all sat and listened to this, every one of us believed them. L.S., a son-in-law, suggested that we all go looking for sign at the site where this occurred. L is from Selawick, Alaska, and he is a hunter. I wanted to go, but was still in my pajamas and robe, so I told them to go without me. When I got there, they were gone, so I returned back to the house. When they returned, Lewis said there were droppings, tracks, and matted down grasses, and chicken feathers, but no sign of bones or other scraps. 
His view of the droppings as related to me then is that they don't belong to a bear or any other animal he knows of. They contain seed and plant materials and bore a resemblance to human feces, except for size and quantity. Before we got to Mescalero in early August, Grandma said she woke up early one morning and noticed a huge handprint on her dining room window, which is a large window beneath which a table sits. She went outside to clean it off so the grandkids and others wouldn't see it and be scared. Grandma is proud of her flower garden of lilies, and she said the flowers were trampled down by something heavy. Again, there were no horses around. In the kitchen on August 24th, I was told that howls and screams occur frequently at night, and that they all have heard them and cannot identify them. They all remarked about the bad odors they have smelled on night, when the dogs, which are tied up, have barked and barked. One of the granddaughters was sitting in the living room one night, watching TV, when she happened to look out the window to see something looking in at her. All she could say was that it was big and hairy. The family advises that these strange sounds and occurrences began in their area about November. There's plenty of cover in this area, including a wash or arroyo, in which Grandma and her daughters go to gather tea which activity they told me they were now afraid to do. They told me that easy access to the river is why there are sightings. They do not believe there is anything they have done to have caused this. I was told that a mountain lion made his or her home on the ridge across from the house, but since these noises and sightings have happened, there is no sign of the cougar anymore. I spoke with Grandma a week or so ago, and she told me that the sounds are heard almost every night at about 2 or 3 a.m. Her daughter works with a man who is tracking owls at night for the EPA. While doing an owl study, evidently, he has seen and heard things on the ridge. There have also been reports of trash cans and dumpsters being rummaged through and people emptying their trash catching something in their headlights at these locations. Witnesses were all family members. In this area, there are lots of local stories, one of which is a sort of legend involving a Hispanic woman who lives or lived near Captain, was supposedly kidnapped by a Bigfoot some years ago, and finally came home with lots of broken bones and pregnant. The child grew up looking funny, so I was told, and always looking for a fight. The family told me about an Apache man who was at a feast somewhere out on the reservation, he left the clearing where the ceremony was taking place and went to the woods to urinate. As he did so, something allegedly picked him up and flung him about. I'm told that this man is big, about six foot two tall, but he was tossed around easily and scared to death. One of the daughters said she had just read an article about some very large tracks being found around Alcali Lake between the town of Alamogordo and Las Cruces, New Mexico, on Highway 70. For some years, I have gone with my family to Mescalero to help cook for the 4th of July feast, which involved the coming out of the girls of the family. We have always camped at the family's place, however. I have been told that the sounds keep people who are camped out there at the feast grounds up almost all night. These sounds come up from the little canyon between the feast grounds and the rodeo grounds on the hill, almost right in Mesa Calero. The family has also told me of other incidents way back when Grandma was young. All of these incidents occurred at dark and late at night. The weather was typical late summer, hot in the day, cool and clear at night. Lighting in all cases was by vehicle headlights. This is rural area, so night lighting is usually from a yard light. These incidents occurred within the boundaries of the homeland of the Mesicolera Apaches in New Mexico. On to the next one. I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the summer during the September elk hunt. I had an experience while stalking for elk with a hunting buddy of mine. I had the feeling something was near but could not tell what. I stopped and waited for a while, but nothing. When we started to walk again, we heard a very loud, low growl, and I mean loud and low growl nearby. 
I have been hunting for a long time now and have been in the wilderness since I was a boy and have never heard anything like this. It scared my partner very much, and since I was the only one armed with a firearm, he did not leave my side for the rest of the day. I had an idea of what it was, but kept it to myself, and did not want to scare my friend more. I told him it was just a bull in heat, and there was cattle all through the area. He kind of believed me. When we got back to camp, we kept the encounter to ourselves. A few other things happened that week. The next day, we found a bear hunting dog in camp. He was very scared of something and very hungry. We tried to get a hold of him to check his collar, but he would have nothing of it. He would stay close to camp, but not close enough to get him. We finally had to leave him there. One of the witnesses was my hunting buddy, and the day before, six others hunting and sitting around the campfire. A hunting dog was found and some strange looking elk rubs. It was early morning at 8.30 a.m., bright and sunny, high desert mountain, oak brush, pinion, and ponderosa pine trees. Also, the next day, I kept my eyes and ears open. Some of the elk rubs did not look right. Not till a couple of years later did I connect what I was seeing. Some of them were tree twists, not scrapes like an elk would do. Reading some books I have read say that Sasquatch mark their territory this way. Years later, I was deer hunting, this time with most of the same people, not in the same area. While sitting around the fire, I just happened to say something about Bigfoot. Some people laughed, but some did not. I took a chance and told them about the previous hunting trip. That night, I found out the night before I got there, the hunting party heard some loud screams and moans from the hill nearby. It scared them enough that they all armed themselves. Some of them to this day still do not believe, but I have played a recording of the Sasquatch sound for some of them, and they say that was what it was. I know that New Mexico would not seem to be Bigfoot country. Most people think of it as a desert, but it is not. We have one of the largest elk populations in the country, and lately we are having more sightings. Where I heard the growl is not far from the Colorado border, and two other sightings in southern New Mexico near Rudoso, which has a large elk herd. I know what I heard, and it was not anything I have heard before. Not a bear, or a big cat, or a bull. It almost sounded human, and very powerful. It thrilled me, and scared me, but I know it is real and out there. To think otherwise would not be sensible. On to the next one. Here's a little background about the events that led up to my encounter. I was preparing for a fall elk hunt in north central New Mexico. I had gathered together a pile of clothing for donation to my favorite local charity. On the Wednesday before I was to leave on my hunting trip, I had taken this pile of clothing into my garage and was going to place them on a shelf to be delivered to the charity as soon as I returned from my hunting trip. I had just started to lean over my ATV when I wrenched my back. I was in the worst pain I had ever experienced. I crawled back into the house and climbed into bed. After about a day and a half bed rest, I was eager to go hunting, though my back was still in great pain. I somehow managed the three-hour trip to our regular hunting area. After arriving at the campsite, my brother, my cousin, and myself downloaded the three ATVs that we would be using on our hunt. This turned out to be a huge mistake on my part, as I aggravated my already sore back. We sacked out for the night. In the morning, we got up at about 5 a.m. We rode into the area that we would be hunting and separated. My brothers and I were going to stay on a traditional productive fence line. Since my back was hurting from the right up, my brother suggested that I take a stand and rest my back. I accepted his advice and took a stand near a clearing with a few good lanes. The weather, although clear and sunny, provided quite a chill. It wasn't long before the cold weather caused my back to tighten up. I was in excruciating pain. My first thought was to get into the nearest clearing where I could get the sun to shine on me and perhaps relieve the shivers. It was at this time that I had decided that relief was little more important than the prospect of bagging an elk. I literally crawled about 50 yards to the nearest clearing 
and leaned myself against a tree stump that stood no more than twenty inches above the ground. As I had hoped, the sun provided enough heat to stop the shivers. I was pretty much immobile, but the shivers were gone. As you can imagine, I was so focused on the pain on my back that I did not pay too much attention to my surroundings. It was about 9 a.m. at this point. As I was laying there, I kept hearing what I thought was a group of squirrels running up and down the forest pine that was nearest to me. I tried to lay as still as possible, but due to the pain in my back, my motions were jerky to say the least. I had my back to the sound that I thought were being created by scampering squirrels, but as my jerky motion forced me to work my way in the direction of the sound, I caught a glimpse of a softball-sized rock bouncing off the trees. At first, I was a bit stunned at this. Then, I recall some old folklore that referred to rock throwing as a trademark of the Sasquatch. Suddenly, the realization hit me that in my condition with back pain, there was no way I would be able to defend myself in a confrontation. I tried to rationalize these flying rocks, but the thought of a hunter trying to scare game out of a relatively open clearing just did not jive. Besides, there was no way that even a pretty physically fit man could heave rocks of that size with a force that I would describe as dangerous if the rock was to have hit a person. For more than a couple of minutes, I would have to say that the rocks were being thrown at intervals of less than a minute. At this time, I was really starting to worry and was scared. Besides the sound of the rocks bouncing off the trees and hitting the ground, there was absolutely no noise. Well, the beating of my heart was pretty loud in my chest. I decided that something was really not right. I called my brother on our two-way radio. He was about 500 or 600 yards away. By this time, the rock throwing had been going on for at least an hour and ten minutes. My brother arrived and saw the rocks as they bounced off the trees and landed one by one just yards away from where we were huddled. If he hadn't seen and experienced the same thing I was, I would wonder if the whole experience was a hallucination. We talked about this strange event for a few minutes, and we glassed the tree line for any sign of what we could conclude could only be a creature throwing in what had to be an overhand motion, judging from the velocity of the flying stone. My brother and I witnessed this together for about 30 minutes after he arrived. To this day, I have pondered what might have thrown those stones. The only two possibilities other than a Bigfoot that would have been possible validly are a bear rooting or another hunter. But based on the size of the rocks being thrown, the velocity and the length of time they were being thrown for, it seems unlikely that either of the other two possibilities are in fact true. My brother and I are both experienced woodsmen and have hunted that area for a number of years. I've spent a great deal of time reading Bigfoot encounters online. The thing that strikes me in particular is the pattern of stories in which the witness claims silence. These creatures seem to have the ability to move through the forest without making a great deal of noise. That is one other factor that makes me believe that my rock throwing experience was an interaction with something that is not yet known to science. Here are two more bits of information that may be of interest. First, the rocks were exiting the tree about eight feet off the ground. They were being thrown with pretty extraordinary force. Second, the terrain was relatively rocky. After the rocks stopped flying, my brother and myself ventured toward where we thought the rocks came from in search of whatever track or sign we could find. But due to the rocky nature of the terrain, we were unable to find a trace. There was an eerie silence. There was no sign of animals, as I recall, just silence prior to and after the rock throwing. This area is heavily wooded and incredibly huge. This event occurred between 9 and 10.30 a.m. It was clear and sunny. The environment was very thick forested area. Elevation was approximately 8,800 feet above sea level. At the time of the occurrence, I was located about halfway down a ridge. On to the next one. This happened in July of 1969. I was 14 years old at the time. Back then, my dad was a heavy equipment operator involved in housing development, building, construction, demolition, 
and damn near anything else that you could think where a piece of heavy equipment was needed. He could run a crane, a dozer, and anything in between. In the back of our house, my dad always kept several 50-gallon drums in which he put his scrap metal, one for brass, one for copper, another for aluminum, and another for wire. This was all the booty, as he used to call it, that he gathered from job sites. A friend of my father's, Mr. Davis, owned a scrapyard where I worked part-time and off the books on weekends. It was then when Mr. Davis told me I could make money in scrapping that my eyes were open to how much cash was laying around in the form of scrap metal. Now, I was too young to drive, but I had a Schwinn bicycle and three baskets on it. That's when I decided to begin my second career, hunting in trash bins and garbage cans for scrap. The Vietnam War was still going on and metals were at a premium. In fact, even as a kid, I knew that many guys were stealing like radiators from cars and Mr. Davis just turned a blind eye and paid up with cash. He had a small block house in the back of his yard that was buried behind mountains of metal where a couple of really creepy guys spent every day chopping so small that nobody would be able to tell what it was when it came in the yard. In other words, they were destroying the evidence. The money was pouring in and out, and it was all cash. I was getting up real early in the morning and making the round all over town on my bike. On garbage day, I would hit hundreds and hundreds of residential trash cans collecting metal. I kept a series of wrenches and hacksaws on my bike to cannibalize anything and everything, including the proverbial kitchen sink. I was having a ball with my little hustle, turning over several hundred dollars a week. In two months' time, I had bought what would be my first car, which was a 1965 Fairlane 500 with a 390 and a 4-speed. I paid $1,000 cash for it, and I was going to sit on it until I could drive. Aside from hitting the neighborhood cans, I began to dumpster dive around the area. A lot of people would sneak into businesses and complexes to throw large items into their dumpsters at night when nobody was around. I started to make some major finds in climbing in and around the bins, but it was a dirty and nasty business. Sometimes I got more than I bargained for, finding a raccoon or something else in the dumpster with me upon getting in it. The other thing was, I had to get into the dumpsters very early in the day because after the sun came up and hit the metal, they were like an oven. You couldn't even touch the metal side without burning your hand. Now, my dad knew that I was responsible and at 14 was already six feet tall. Every morning, I got up at 4 a.m. and went out on my round. I had learned my lesson several times over about just opening the lid on a garbage dumpster early in the morning. On this particular morning, I was approaching a three dumpster compound near the rear of a large trailer park. This set of dumpsters alone usually represented a five or ten dollar hit for me every time I came to them. Now, these dumpsters were set on a concrete slab in the dark up against the wood. I always carried a couple of flashlights with me in case one broke or went dead while I was out diving. It was pretty dark as I was riding up to the site because it was cloudy and there hadn't been a moon. There was a lot of noise coming from one of the dumpsters and the steel lid was slapping up and down. The first thing I said to myself was that there was a bear inside. I turned and parked my bike about a hundred feet away and picked up a couple of rocks to throw at the dumpster to scare off whatever was in there anyway. When I chucked the first rock, I hit the bin squarely, which sounded like a sledgehammer hitting the side of a steel drum. 
As soon as I heard the noise, the metal lid came blowing open and out from the can like a jack-in-the-box jumped this screaming gorilla. He flew out, clearing the side of the dumpster in one clean jump, and the lid came crashing down behind him. The side of the dumpster was nearly five feet tall, and he was maybe three feet taller than the can. He was standing next to it, snorting and growling like a wild boar. The noise was so loud that light started to go on all around from the different trailers. A couple of men actually came out of their front doors. Now, I was standing in the dark next to my bike, hoping that this monster wasn't going to attack me. But I don't think it had the time to realize that I was even there. It turned and darted away into the woods and was gone. It was only a minute later when a man ran over with a flashlight and said to me, What the heck? going on, young fella. When I tried to explain to him what had happened, he didn't believe me. I told him that I was telling the God's honest truth. He said to me, there are no big gorillas in Florida or anywhere else. Now get on out of here before I call the police. Well, as you would imagine, I left in a hurry and went straight home to tell my dad. He knew that I was not prone to lying and frankly, he was having a hard time swallowing what I was saying. Later that day, he and I drove back over to where this thing had jumped out of the dumpster. We were walking over to the can as I described to my dad in detail what had happened. As we walked next to the can, we looked down at exactly where I had told him the gorilla had landed. There were huge impressions in the soil next to the concrete slab. They were two large human-like feet and the impressions were about two inches into the dirt. As soon as he saw them, his entire demeanor had changed. He looked at me and then into the woods where I told him it had run. I remember him just shaking his head and saying, what the heck is a gorilla doing over here? Anyway. We both got back into the truck and went back home. That apparently was all the proof my dad needed. I told him that it didn't look like any other gorilla pictures that I had ever seen, it being way too tall and wide to be in the zoo. I called it the monster gorilla and he just shook his head. On to the next one. My story took place in the summer of 2010, in early August. I was between jobs, as in unemployed, so I decided to take some of my savings and do something I've always wanted to do, go to Canada. I've always wanted to see the Canadian Rockies, so I got my passport, and since I have three dogs, I got their shots all current along with their veterinarian exam papers that Canada required. After all that, I was never asked to see the dog's papers, but I sure didn't want to risk not being legal. I live in Wyoming, so I decided to just head north and see the country at a leisurely pace. I went through the Tetons and Yellowstone and finally arrived at Glacier National Park about three weeks later. I was an old hand at camping, having done it since I was a kid. I was camped kind of illegally in Glacier, way out on a back dirt road, off the highway that looped from St. Mary's around to Hungry Horse, the back road that most tourists don't take as they want to go over the Going to Sun Road. It was a sweet camp and I set up my big tent and all, and I knew nobody ever went in there because the grasses were growing so high you could barely find the road, which ended at my campsite. And man, what views! I could look down and see St. Mary's Lake and huge distant waterfalls from my tent door. It was paradise. Because of finding this great spot, I decided I'd go up into Waterton National Park in Canada and make it a one-day trip instead of packing up and then trying to find a camp spot up there. 
a friend who had been up there, told me that the park would be very crowded that time of year. I wanted to spend most of my time in Canada, in Banff and Jasper National Park, and I wanted to backtrack through Montana and cross the border north of Kalispell, so I wanted to come back down that way anyways. No need to change camp. I got up really early, made some coffee, filled my thermos, fed the dog, grabbed some lunch stuff, and then we all jumped into my pickup and headed for Canada. It was a beautiful drive, and we crossed the border with no problems and were soon coming down the grade into Waterton. I couldn't believe the size of these mountains. Even though I'd just been in the glacier, they seemed bigger and even more magnificent. I had to stop several times to just sit and stare. Well, I made it into Waterton, and boy, was I disappointed. The park advertises itself as a quiet, untrammeled place, and I suppose it is in general, but the little town of Waterton is a tourist trap bar none. It was hard to even find a place to turn around, and the streets were packed with people walking around with nowhere to even park. I drove around a bit, checked out the little waterfall there, then left, heading for Cameron Lake, which is at the end of a windy road that climbs high in the mountains above Waterton. The lake was beautiful, with a white glacier hanging above its far shores. But, once again, it was crowded with people. You could rent canoes there, and the lake was just hopping with boats. I found a little side trail that I had no idea where it went, but it said dogs were allowed, so I put everyone on leashes and headed out. They needed a hike. I hadn't got more than 50 feet when I was greeted by a group of about 20 people coming up the trail, yelling and laughing and all that. I don't usually mind people, but well, okay, I do mind people when I want solitude, and I especially wanted to let the dog stretch their legs a bit. This wasn't the place. We got back in the truck and headed back down the windy road. I was too busy watching the road and dodging RVs to even see much of the scenery, and there was almost no places to turn off and get out, so that was kind of a blur. I decided to go see a place called Red Rock Canyon. It was in the opposite direction from how I'd come into the park. So I turned left at the bottom of the hill and let everyone else go back to Waterton. Good riddance. Red Rock Canyon sounded attractive to me because the name reminded me a little bit of the Red Rock Desert in Wyoming. I guess I was getting a bit homesick by that time. The Canadian Rockies are all sedimentary rock, not granite or volcanic, which makes them truly spectacular because they have lots of layers and colors. Red Rock Canyon sounded like a place I should see. One thing I discovered about Waterton was that you could hike with your dogs, unlike the national parks in the U.S., which I found to be a very cool thing about Canada. Well, there wasn't much traffic on the Red Rock Road, which was nice, and it wasn't all narrow and windy. Once you got up above the highway a bit, it kind of went through a big wide valley with a nice creek running through with lots of willows. A good place for moose. I remember thinking, though I never did see any. I hope I'm not getting into too much detail here and boring you, but I really want to paint a picture of how it was. Anyways, I hadn't gone more than a few miles when I saw a sign saying that the road to the canyon was closed at certain point for construction. Great. No Red Rock Canyon for me. I was getting kind of fed up with Waterton National Peace Park, as Canada called it, pretty as it was. By now, I really needed to get the dogs out. I spied a campground to the left across the creek, so I turned in there, but the sign said full so I just turned around and went down the road. Too many people everywhere. You have to remember that I'm from Wyoming, and there's almost no one around where I live, so I'm not used to many people. Before long, I came to a turnout that had a historical marker, so I stopped there. I read the marker, 
and I can only recall that it was something about the native there and some explorer, but I don't recall anything about who or when. I let the dogs out for a minute, and they went into the bushes and did their thing. Then I decided this would be a great spot to get them out for some exercise. I was kind of wishing I just stayed at my camp in Glacier, as we would have had a nice day just goofing around there, but on the other hand, at least I'd seen Waterton now, or a bit of it anyway. But we were used to getting out, and we needed some exercise. We headed up a big hill that appeared to be part of the foothills of a big mountain that rose above them. I mean, a really big mountain. It was beautiful, all layered in various shades of red. The dogs were really happy to be out, and we all kind of bundled up this big hill for a bit. I had to stop and catch my breath, and the views were stunning. I was really enjoying this, and now liking Waterton, and so were the dogs. But all of a sudden, the dogs stopped cold. They just stood there, looking ahead, and as I came up behind them, I could see that the one closest to me, Otis, was shaking. I've never seen my dog shake. I then noticed they were all shaking. Before I could even say a word, two of them had turned and were hightailing it back to the truck fast as they could go. We didn't have to come very far, so they were back down there really fast, and I could see them crawling under the truck. Now Otis was running back too. He was very protective of me, and I've never seen him do anything like that. I decided it must be a big grizzly bear, and maybe they could smell it. Where I couldn't, so I was soon also heading back at a good cliff. I unlocked the truck and everyone jumped in, which was unusual, as I typically have to get after them. They always want to fiddle around, smell everything. I jumped in and locked the door. Now I started scanning the hills, wondering why we were all so scared. I finally rolled down my window, but I didn't hear or see anything. By now, another car had pulled up to the red sign, and they smiled at me and got out and acted like everything was fine. I was puzzled. What had the dog sent or smelled? I've been a bit of a photographer since I was a kid, even though I never could afford nice equipment, but most of my stuff was landscape photos, as there wasn't much where I lived except deer and antelope in the sense of wildlife. But ever since going through Yellowstone, I'd come to understand why people are so attracted to wildlife photography. I'd taken some photos there of wolves and buffalo and even a huge great horned owl. So I was kind of hoping this grizzly would come out. At some point, I sat there a bit even though the dogs were again shivering. I have a club cab, and Sunny and Maggie were in the back, hiding on the floor. My dogs aren't all labs, and they're happy-go-lucky. I don't think they think enough about things to get scared much. Even fireworks don't bother them, so I knew this had to be something really scary. I rolled the windows back up. The other car left. I started the pickup and turned it so I could make a quick getaway if needed, then turned it off and just sat there. Whatever it was, it was all around, according to the dog. I got my camera ready to go. By now, it was going on towards late afternoon. It had been a long day, and I wanted to take a picture of the grizzly bear. Then I would head back to Glacier. Just then, something huge jumped onto the back of my truck. I have a camper shell, so whatever it was had to have jumped onto the bumper. The whole front end of the truck came up, including the front wheels. We just hung there in the air for a minute. I was shocked and dropped my camera. I couldn't see what was holding the truck up, but it was something big. I hadn't seen anything coming, which was really strange, as I kept looking around and in the rearview mirror. Just then, I heard a braking sound. My truck was falling apart. The front came down with a wham, and I nearly smashed my nose on the steering wheel. I had the persistence of mine to start the truck and slam it into gear and peel out while I could. Dirt and rocks went flying into the air, and I know they must have hit this thing in the face, as it had to be standing directly behind me. As I peeled out into the blacktop, I felt something slam against the side of the truck, and I saw a big tree branch rolling down the road 
behind me. By then, I had the accelerator floored and was quickly getting up speed, but not fast enough because I noticed something in my passenger side rear mirror, and this really shook me up. Something big and human-like was chasing me, wearing a fur coat, and it had nearly caught up. It looked like it was trying to grab onto the door handle. I reached down and hit the auto lock, making sure all the doors were locked. By now, Otis was whining, his head off and the seat beside me. Maggie and Sunny were still on the floor, so I couldn't see them at all. By now, my truck had ramped up and we were finally able to leave this thing behind. I never did get a, a really good look at it, but I can tell you this, it was no grizzly. What I did see was huge and covered in light brown, long flowing hair. It was a Canadian Sasquatch. And you can believe me or not, it doesn't matter either way because I know what I saw. I drove like a madman towards Red Rock Canyon. The directions I had, I'd forgotten. The road would be closed, so I was surprised when I got a mile or two down the road and saw a flagger ahead wearing orange. It was a woman and she stopped me and told me I had to turn around and go back. I was in shock and I told her I couldn't turn around and go back. I hardly knew what I was saying. She said I had to turn around as they were working on the road. I just sat there. Finally, another car came up behind me. I turned around and pulled over to let the other car go around me. It then dawned on me that I should get out and see how much damage my truck had taken. What I saw really messed with my mind. My entire bumper was gone and there was a big dent where the tree branch had hit it, just above the wheel well. It also dawned on me that I needed to get that bumper back as it had my license plate on it. I expected that I'd lost my bumper back down the road and I needed someone to help me load it into my truck. Would they mind following along and helping? About then, a pickup came along with Montana plate, and I flagged it down. I explained that I'd lost my bumper back down there, and I needed someone to help me load it into my truck. Would they mind following along and helping? The driver was a real nice guy. He looked like a rancher or something, and he said he would. I hoped I wasn't getting them involved in something bad, but when I got the pullover, I slowed down and did a quick look around, then pulled over. Sure enough, my bum barely there. I hoped the squatch had moved on. The guy from Montana got out and asked me what happened, but I couldn't tell him the truth. So I said I'd backed into a rock and hadn't realized it until later. He looked skeptical, but helped me load it into the back of my truck. I couldn't wait to get out of there, especially after I smelled a strong, skunky odor. I thanked him and he asked me if I was okay. I decided to tell the truth, so I quickly told him what had happened. He commented on the strong odor and then jumped into his truck and drove away. I think he believed me. I was right behind him. The drive back was a blur. I don't really remember anything, not even the border crossing. By the time I got back to little resort town of St. Mary, no way did I have the courage to go back to my camp. So I rented a room, no matter that it was really expensive and I had to sneak the dogs in. I didn't care. The next day, I drove back to my camp. What I saw scared the heck out of me. All around the tent were huge bear tracks. I know it was a grizzly, had just walked around a bunch. I was then glad I stayed at the motel, because if I'd come back, who knows what would have happened. Maybe that was why nobody had camped there for so long. It was prime grizzly territory. I packed everything up and headed home. I'd go see Bam and Jasper another day, which I did, but from the comfort of motel rooms at night. I've never camped since, except in the desert, but I've often wondered if the Sasquatch hadn't felt like I did that day. Thick of the tourists everywhere. On to the next one. The story that I am about to share with you is not very long, neither will I try to embellish it in any way, shape, or form to make more of it than it really was. So strange was this experience in and of itself that I felt I must contact you and share the events that surrounded it with you and your listeners. 
I had entered the woods southwest of Quenelle, which borders the province of Alberta, into what is well known locally as the caribou country. Although I had been in the timber for three consecutive days and had seen many bulls, I had but one tag, and I wasn't going to settle for anything but the best. The day was filled with brilliant sunshine and was virtually cloudless as I worked my way in and around some fairly rough terrain. I was about three hours into my hike when I found myself sitting on the side of a hill. I was within somewhat of a rocky crag overlooking a small field of wild grasses which was backed by the tall pines. Having hiked more than likely over 20 miles in the three days, I leaned my head back against the stone and nodded off. I hadn't known I nodded off until I opened my eyes, and as I did, there was an enormous Sasquatch standing some 20 feet in front of me and staring at me. In the moment, having just awakened, I wasn't sure if I was in fact awake or dreaming. Truth be told, I wasn't even aware that I had fallen asleep. So, there I was, being confronted with the visage of this huge beast. And in my mind, it was almost as though it had just materialized out of nowhere. The creature was standing perfectly still, as though it was a statue, and was staring at me without so much as a blink of an eye or a flinch, not wanting to move, and frankly, not knowing what to do or what could happen next. I moved my head and my eye slowly to my left hand and my right, looking for my rifle, and it was gone. I shifted my eyes down to my side, and my pistol was still holstered on my belt. The size and dimensions of this beast were such that from its proximity to me, in two steps, it could prevail upon me at any moment, so I stayed put and did not reach for the holster. It must have been about two minutes or so after having opened my eyes that this monster now stood stationary before me, but it seemed like an hour. I had seen my watch when I looked down at the holster and the time was 9.47 a.m. As I looked down once again, it was 12.34. I lifted my eyes, and there was no longer a Sasquatch in front of me, and my rifle was once again by my side. Words cannot describe the feelings and thoughts that were present within me at that moment. I stood to my feet, and was quite literally scratching my head, trying to come to grips with what I was thinking. Had it all been a dream? Putting the strap of my rifle over my shoulder, I began to walk as the cobwebs of what had transpired were still enveloping my very being. It was then, after having had taken several steps in front of me, that my eyes were drawn downward at the ground that lay before me, within the soft soil at the edge of the hill in the very spot where, in my mind, I had been looking at the Sasquatch were several well-formed large footprints. A shiver went down my spine from head to toe. This wasn't a dream after all, and here was the evidence to prove it. I will not pretend to tell you that I can even begin to wrap my mind around the series of events which befell me on that day. All that I can say is what you have already heard. I had leaned back to rest, being very tired from three days' activities on the hunt, when apparently I had fallen asleep. Upon opening my eyes, the Sasquatch was standing before me, unmoving, and my rifle was gone. Having looked down to ascertain whether or not I still had possession of my handgun, my mind registered the time as being 9.47 a.m., after which I then apparently fell back asleep, although I have no recollection of doing so, and woke again at 12.34 p.m. to see my gun by my side 
and the Sasquatch being gone. And so, what exactly would you or I, or anyone else for that matter, be left to think about such a thing having happened? I can tell you that as I sat on the hillside, the day was very blustery with gusts of about 20 miles per hour. As the Sasquatch stood before me, motionless, I could see the long hair on its body blowing in the wind, in particular, the hairs on its head moving across its face and brow. This creature had to have been ten feet tall or better, having a body as wide as my barn door. It didn't blink or so much as move a finger. It simply stood there before me and stared. One of the strangest things was that I felt no fear and was not startled in the least during this entire event, feeling rather like I was heavily medicated or in somewhat of a daze as I remained leaning against the rock wall. On to the next story. My grandpa was a crusty old guy, a real Wisconsin character. He lived in the same cabin he'd been raised in way up by a lake in the timber, and he left only when my parents finally persuaded him to go live with them. I have many fond memories of going up to the cabin with my brother to stay with Gramps. We spent part of our summers there. Well, until this incident anyway. Then we quit going. After this, my dad would go stay with him some, and he finally persuaded Gramps to move in with us. Well, Gramps' cabin was old and rustic and had lots of leaks, but Gramps lived there year-round, cutting his own wood for winter and growing a big garden, such that you can when you have such a short growing season. He had water right there in a little stream that came by his place, and he canned his vegetables and dried the meat from the deer he hunted. It was kind of like a paradise in some ways, until winter anyway. But I was glad when he finally moved in with mom and dad. He seemed to be getting frailer and frailer, and the thought of him being alone out in the woods was kind of unsettling. Maybe because he wasn't really alone. As you'll see, this story happened one sunny summer day. Well, summer night, actually. My brother and I had been playing poker with Gramps. He loved to play poker. And it was getting pretty late, so we finally hit the hay. As usual, Gramps had won all our change, though he would always let us win it back the next day. Gramps slept in the little bedroom in the cabin, and Jason and I slept on cots in what was the only other room, kind of a combination kitchen and living room. We had a busy day doing what kids do in the woods, and we were tired. We both fell asleep pretty fast and were soon sleeping hard as rock. I think this happened when I was 14 and Jason was 15. We were what you call Irish cousins, born barely a year apart. Sometime in the night, I woke, not sure why, as I hadn't been dreaming or anything. I just woke from a dead sleep, just like that. I felt really uneasy. I knew something was wrong. My instincts have always been pretty accurate that way. And I just lay there, listening. And the longer I listened, the weirder I felt. But I couldn't hear anything unusual. It was strange. I finally wondered if I wasn't just imagining things. I finally drifted back to sleep, only to be awakened again by Jason, poking me in the ribs. He was crouched down by my cot, kind of like he was hiding, and he half scared me to death. Be quiet, Tommy. Don't make a sound. Just get up and sneak over into the corner with me behind the stove. Stay low. Oh man, this was weird. Why was Jason being so dramatic? It wasn't like him. He never played pranks, so I knew 
something was up. I rolled off the cot and crawled over behind the big pot-bellied wood stove with Jason right behind me. I tried to make myself small as I crouched down behind it. Jason put his hand on my arm and I could tell he was shaking. I remembered that I'd woken up earlier and I knew something strange was going on. Jason put his hand over my mouth as if he was worried I'd yell or something, then pointed to the little window above the kitchen sink. There, I could see a dark figure, a big head actually, and it was looking right into the cabin. Jeez, I knew it had to be a bear, but what kind of bear would be bold and curious enough to come right up to the cabin window and look in, and it had to be the quietest bear ever, as it made not even the slightest noise. We need to get Gramps up, I said. He has the rifle. Gramps always kept the rifle in his bedroom. Let's see what it does. Maybe it'll leave, Jason whispered. Then he added, holy crap, look at those eyes. The bear's eyes were now glowing greenish red, just like it had turned on a flashlight and that light was scanning the room like it was looking for us. Crap is right, I whispered back. Stay still, that thing is huge. We both continued to hide behind the big stove, hoping the bear couldn't see us, and we were now totally terrified. Soon, the head disappeared. We decided to make a break for it and go wake up Gramps. We ran like bats out of hell into the bedroom where we shook Gramps awake. The old guy was getting hard of hearing, so we had to shake him awake. Otherwise, he wouldn't hear a thing. About the only way we could ever even make him hear us anymore was to yell right at him. He woke up with a start and set straight up. I think we scared the old guy half to death, but we didn't want to yell at him. So we were in kind of a quandary as to how to tell him what was going on. If we yelled, we knew we would alert the bear as to where we'd gone. We tried to tell Gramps using a sort of sign language we made up on the spot, but he just sat there half asleep looking both alarmed and mystified. He seemed kind of put out at us for waking him up. Finally, I thought to get some paper and a pen off his dresser, and I wrote him a note, using my pocket flashlight to show him. Giant bear window glowing eye. Gramps now looked alarmed and got up. He pulled on his trousers and getting his gun out of the closet, he loaded it and fearlessly walked out into the living room. We followed like puppy dogs, scared and with our tails between our legs. Gramps must have wondered if we were really his own grandkids or some kind of import as his kin would never be scared of a bear, glowing eyes or not. He opened the door and shot into the air several times, then closed the door, walked back into his bedroom, put the gun away, and went back to bed, leaving me and Jason feeling kind of inadequate. It had been such a simple thing dealing with this bear, so why hadn't we just taken action and done the same thing and not woken him up? Okay, in the future, we'd be more like Gramps instead of hiding behind the stove. We'd go in and get his gun, not wake him up. But Gramps hadn't actually seen this thing, and maybe he would have been less cavalier if he had. Oh well, we thought. Time to go back to bed. It took me a while to go back to sleep, and I finally got up and hung a towel over the window. I didn't sleep too well the rest of the night in spite of this, and Jason said he didn't sleep a wink. Well, the next morning, Gramps wanted to know what was going on, so we told him. When we were done, he looked pretty grim, and he led us outside to look around. The cabin was surrounded by forest, and there were needles and tufts everywhere, so we didn't see any tracks. But right under the kitchen window, the pine needles were pressed down like something heavy had stood there. Gramps studied it real close, 
then looked even more grim. He started yelling into the woods like a madman. Well, because he was mad. You dang forest people, stay away from here. I'll shoot every last one of you. Okay, this made me and Jason pause. Forest people? Who were they? I asked and Gramps muttered something about how they were no good and for us to stay close to the cabin until he could deal with them. We got the feeling this had gone on before. That night, Gramps sat out with us by the big stove longer than usual. He was in the mood to talk, and he started telling us about the forest people. Jason and I couldn't believe what we were hearing. And if we hadn't seen the thing in the window ourselves, we would have thought he was pulling our legs. He told us about when his parents first came out there and built the cabin, and how the forest people had tried to scare them away. He'd been a little boy, and he was forbidden to ever leave the cabin without an adult. His parents had finally moved the family into town, but... They all returned a year later as they wanted to homestead. By then, the forest people had torn down the original cabin, and they had to start all over again. This second time, his dad had lost patience and actually began shooting at the forest people, though he really didn't want to kill them, just run them off. Gramps told stories about seeing them in the woods when he got older, and was able to go out alone, though he always carried a gun. He didn't think they were dangerous, but it scared him to death when he would see them, as they were big and powerful looking. As time went by, they came around less and less frequently, until finally they didn't come around at all. It had been years since he'd seen any evidence of them, but he had thought he'd seen one the last time, me and Jason were visiting, and he was thinking maybe they were attracted to us since we were kids, and he knew they liked kids. We just sat there listening, wondering if Gramps hadn't been living in the woods alone too long. But we knew what we'd seen, and at that point we were pretty much ready to go home, except we didn't want to leave Gramps there alone. We tried to talk him into coming into town when mom and dad were scheduled to come get us, but he just laughed and said we were being silly, that the forest people wouldn't hurt anybody. Except he wondered if maybe they didn't kidnap kids once in a while, as the lake had a bad reputation and there'd been a couple of kids go missing there over the years. We didn't like hearing that one bit. Now we were really ready to go home, but our parents wouldn't come pick us up for another week. We decided we wouldn't go outside unless Gramps was right there with us. That night all was quiet, and the towel over the window made me feel better, as I knew nobody could see us now. Jason and I lay there for a while, talking in low voices, with the light out discussing what Gramps had told us about the forest people. I finally drifted off, but only to once again startle awake in the early hours. I looked at the kitchen window, but the towel was still there. Jason whispered, Tommy, are you awake? Did you hear that? What was it? I asked. There's something messing around outside. Sounds like it's behind the house, outside Gramps' bedroom. I lay still and listened. Something was making a low moaning noise, and it would then bang against the back side of the cabin. Gramps can't hear it, I whispered, and it sounds like it might be trying to get to him. We both rolled off our cot and crawled quietly into Gramps' bedroom. He was snoring like a saw cutting logs, totally oblivious to the racket outside. Jason crawled over by the dresser where Gramps' rifle stood in the corner. He picked it up, got some ammo from the dresser drawer where Gramps kept it, then carefully loaded the gun. He now walked back into the living room and I followed. We would deal with this on our own and not wake Gramps up, or so we thought. 
I held the door open while Jason stepped out a foot or two and shot the rifle into the air. Neither of us had spent much time around guns, and he wasn't prepared for the recoil, which almost knocked him down. He came stumbling backward into me, and both of us almost bit the dust, but we managed to stay on our feet. I slammed the door shut just as I saw something really big and black come around the corner of the cabin. I locked the door and then quickly put a chair up against it, as if that would have any effect at all on stopping an animal that big. Jason stood there, rifle pointed at the door, and we both held our breath. We were scared to death. Of course, the rifle shot woke Gramps up, and he came into the living room with his skinny bare legs sticking out of his oversized BVD. He kind of reminded me of a chicken with his pot belly and skinny legs. He saw Jason with the rifle and immediately figured out what was going on. Now he was mad. Are they back? He asked with a scowl on his face. Jason nodded his head yes as Gramps took the rifle from him. Gramps then opened the front door and went outside, BVDs and all. I kind of wondered if he wasn't a bit more scary looking at that point than the forest people were. We instinctively followed him, though we were both scared to death. Gramps didn't seem a bit scared, and we were now worried about him. I guess we were feeling protective of the old guy, even though he was the one with the gun. Well, as I went out the door, I realized we were in deep trouble when I heard the lock click behind me. I hadn't really unlocked it, just pulled it open from the inside. I tried the handle, and sure enough, we were locked out. The old cabin only had two windows, the one above the kitchen sink and the small window in the living room. There was no way any of us would fit through the kitchen window, and Jason might barely fit through the other one, but being the smaller of us three, Jason, we're locked out. I whispered to my brother. He turned with a panicked look in his eyes and verified what I had told him. Crap, he said, immediately going to the living room window and trying it. It was also locked. Meanwhile, Gramp had gone around the side of the cabin, muttering and looking for something to shoot at. I didn't know whether to follow him and make sure he was okay or to try to break into the cabin. Jason was trying to pry the window open, so I decided to follow Gramps. I was going around the corner of the cabin in the dark, following Gramps, when I heard moaning again. It was terrifying, like something from a horror movie, and it sounded like it was right around the corner where Gramps had just gone. And of course, it was too dark, so I couldn't see a thing. I felt my way along the back wall of the cabin, thinking that surely... I would catch up to Gramps soon, and sure enough, I did, bumping into him and scaring the bejeebers out of him. He must have jumped three feet in the air, and for a minute, I thought I was going to get shot. And now the moaning was right there, right by where Gramps stood, and he was looking at me, even madder because I'd scared him. I knew he couldn't hear the sound, and it sounded like it was right behind him. I yelled at him and pointed behind him, but it was so dark he couldn't even see my hand. Right over Gramps' shoulder were those eyes, those red-green glowing eyes, and they stood way above both me and Gramps. This thing was huge, and it was about to get my grandpa, and I couldn't make him understand what was happening. I didn't even think about it. I just grabbed the rifle from Gramps, and pointed it at the eye. I hesitated, as I didn't want to kill anything, and just as I paused, Gramps turned and saw it. I pulled the trigger, but I shot purposefully wide, and the thing jerked back as if I'd shot it, then disappeared into the darkness. I knew I hadn't shot it. I couldn't have possibly shot it, but I was worried just the same. I grabbed Gramps' arm and steered him around the front of the cabin, where we were still locked out. The thing was moaning again off to our left, and now it sounded really angry. 
It soon began banging on the side of the cabin, but it stayed around back, where we couldn't see it. Jason was now crawling through the window, and we were soon all inside. I just stood there by the big stove, wide-eyed and white-faced, as Gramps started a pot of coffee, cussing and fussing the whole time. He obviously couldn't hear a thing and had no idea what kind of racket the thing was making. It was soon dawn, and things now got quiet outside. We collected our wits. Gramps was going on and on about the forest people while drinking coffee. He had said they were harmless, but they sure didn't feel that way to me. That day, Jason and I walked down the road to the neighbors, who had a phone, and we called Dad. We told him to come and get us, though we couldn't tell him the real reason with the neighbors listening in. Dad arrived that evening, and we packed up to leave, begging Gramps to come with us. Of course, he refused, acting like he was surprised that we were leaving over something so trivial as a Bigfoot terrorizing us. That was pretty much it for us wanting to go stay at the cabin. And it wasn't long before Gramps finally gave up and moved in with us. We were glad he had survived it all. And to this day, I wondered how many times he'd been terrorized by a Bigfoot and didn't even know it. I guess ignorance is bliss, as they say. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!